we are pleased to be able to offer this virtual conference session free of charge to ensure that anyone that wants to participate can. If you are able to, we hope that you will donate to support the work of the OI Foundation, which includes providing important programs like this one. Any amount is helpful and you can donate online at HTTPS OIF dot org slash donations slash virtual conference. Work with the foundation uh, day after day. Uh, I hope you will su support this extraordinary effort to have pulled this national meeting out from oblivion and to have made it so wonderful and open to so many people is a credit to the fantastic staff at the foundation. So we're going to begin with the good Dr. Esposito, who's going to talk to us about early decision making, critical for the parent who discovers they have a child with OI. Thank you, Paul. Here we go. I think my screen is up. You are good. Okay. So, so this is one of, I've had the privilege of being with this group many, many times, and I really am disappointed we're not in person. And this is actually the title of the first talk I ever gave at the OI meeting when I was here in Omaha, Nebraska, a few years ago, probably about 18, I think. And the biggest thing is, we all listen and talk to you and watch the children to decide who needs surgery. There's no right and wrong answer. And people always say, when should my child have surgery? And it's when you need it. So early on, you know, we, not every child needs surgery, but we want to look at when do they need it. And that's when they're fracturing, when they're having pain, when it's happening over and over again. And we've had enough medical management to know where they are and can we do something that has more of a chance of working than hurting. Because obviously you c any surgery can have complications. We want to avoid that if at all possible. And I think the experience with most people is we've been able to do some amazing things without a lot of complications. But when the complications happen, it's a big deal. So we look at the kids when they're about trying to stand up. Yep. And with bisphosphonate treatment, many kids with type 3 and type 4, that's usually about 12 to 18 months. So you want to look at when are they being active and when are they getting at risk. And that's when they start to fracture more. The other things we look at is fracture patterns. You can see on this right femur here, it's right at the apex of the bow. And children are born with that bow, and that bow generally never goes away totally. Uh, you can straighten it out, and usually that's a site where they're going to have some issues as time goes on. But you have to correct all the bowing and if you are going to do surgery and mechanically make the child about mechanically aligned. But 30 degrees is kind of the magic thing we look at. And people always ask, well, when is that going to fracture and we say well, well we'd like to do the surgery the day before they fracture because it's obviously a very very painful thing but it's not easy to predict that but this one you could pretty much predict so and again surgeries can go bad that on the femur there that's a very nicely lined up femur it's uh, healed well but the rod backed out a little bit so you have to be able to willing to accept that there are going to be some issues uh, and the younger the children are probably the more common those issues are but they do heal more quickly when they do fracture uh, and they were clearly more mobile. So that's our goal is make the child mobile. And that time frame of about 12 to 36 months is when the, growth, the majority of psychomotor development is going on. That's when children are exploring the world. That's when they're trying to climb up on the coffee tables. That's when they're getting in trouble. And that's when we want them to be active. So early on though, we, you know, one of the nice things about having done this for a while now, we haven't seen many kids coming in on the pillow anymore. And I think that's a, tribute to the OI Foundation and to the parents groups to take care of each other and say, we need to be able to hold our children, hug them and, and not crush them, but hold them uh, and let them go. And that does mean that there are going to be fractures and every parent has to learn how to deal with that. So I think the splinting kits early on, medical management really helps that a great deal with bisphosphonates and the more severely involved kids. And there are obviously videos out there on, on how to do splinting. We provide a splint kit to all of our children that come here for clinic. I think the parent groups also have the material available, uh, but it can be done very well. And it's probably more important in the first year of life than any type of surgeries, which are rarely done. So every child's unique. Uh, and the, and the, the thing you wanna look at is, are they having fractures over and over and how much deformity are they having? If it's just a little bit of bow, there was a question yesterday that Dr. Wallace, they fielded, will bowing resolve? And usually not. 
if it's five degrees, 10 degrees, close to a joint, maybe it will, but bowing like this in that upper femur is not gonna go away. How active is the child uh, and how's the medic, how have they done with their medical management? Rarely is there a child that has bone at 18 months to 24 months that will not accommodate a rod, uh, but there are cases when you have to be really careful doing that. And what about what bone do you pick? Obviously femurs hurt a lot, but I'll tell you, most parents tell me that a humerus will hurt just as much. And one of my mothers very early on told me, you're gonna fix the arm. And I said, well, why? And I kept asking her why. She said, because you can't sit up. So I think it's very important for you to look at where is the child, work together with your physicians, and say, what's most important for my child right now? And sometimes that's fixing a humerus. Uh, and it's not always easy, but if that's what's functionally getting in the way, that's what you ought to consider. So the femur is obviously the most cause of spasm and, and the pain management program that was put on, I think was outstanding. I know Dr. Geller has, a, a, has developed a protocol for what do we think you should have at home with you uh, for when your child breaks. It doesn't mean you have to have a month's supply of narcotics, but you should have some Valium and some, some enough narcotic to get your child splinted and comfortable. Uh, so each time they break, they're more likely to break again. Each time they break, they bow more. So usually 12 months is roughly when I'll start thinking about fixing a femur. Uh, so most of the time we'll do both femurs at the same time because they're both deformed. Uh, you can do the tibias. I used to do them all every time uh, at four, 18. Standing up because I think you get better results if you can wait a little longer. And you want to protect the soft tissues. And just to tell you how much we've learned over the years, this, is, this child just graduated from high school and I'm not gonna use her name, but uh, obviously that's what we're trying to do is minimize the soft tissue damage. So people always ask too, how much time are you gonna get? And other, others will talk about that. I know femurs can be anywhere from two years to 10 years, depending on how old the child is, what the deformity is, a case, and we don't have to do a femur a second time. Uh, tibial rods can be transformative, but I think again, if you can wait a little while to get them, they, they tend to last a little longer. Uh, and again, the question is, when do you do surgery? Well, the earlier you do it, obviously the earlier the revisions. If your child's femur is only eight centimeters in length, you're not gonna get much growth out of eight centimeters. Uh, and there, there are complications, but they're rare, but you have to always consider that. Rods can grow down in, rods can back out, and growth problems surprisingly have been rare. And I don't think any of us in the 25 years or so since Dr. Fossier developed this whole process have seen a growth the rest. There may be one or two, but it's really, really rare. So how many times does your child need surgery? Again, they'll talk about that later. My, our experience has been probably in kids with type three and four, it's probably two to three times for each bone that gets done because kids do outgrow it, but that varies from child to child. We've seen children where we corrected the bones at, at uh, a year and a half of age, and by the time they're mature, they look like they have little toothpicks in their bones because we just leave them alone. But that's not the experience of most of the kids. Most of the time is, if you do this once, you're gonna come back again. So in summary, it's kind of a very individualized decision. It depends how active the child is, how many fractures they're having, how much deformity they have. The decision is always made with the parents uh, and the caregivers. It's, none of us make the decisions on our own. Decisions can be a little different from center to center, uh, just, but that's just, if parents think that's something big, it usually is not. The ultimate goal for all of us is to maximize the comfort and function and keep the pain down to a minimum. And it's a team approach. So that's what I got for now. Thanks tremendously, Paul. Great to have you on board today uh, and, and to give that good overview. We're now going to move to Dr. Esposito's partner, Dr. Megan Wallace, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Orthopedics, also from Omaha. And she's going to tell us about upper extremity management, which frankly, for so many years, was a non-starter for many of us. Um, and, and I would argue that this team has helped us uh, see the potential uh, for upper extremity management. Thanks. Um, is this in presentation mode for you guys? No. Let me try again.
There you go. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about upper extremity um, deformity today. Thanks for allowing me to participate. Um, I really appreciate it. So the upper extremity deformities, uh, like Dr. Esposito alluded to, we have the, the humerus um, deformities and this can happen in very young children. It can also happen in children who are a bit older. Um, this is a child who's um, a couple years of age. You can see some bowing deformity and a fracture. And this is actually a teenager who had never had any troubles with his arm until he broke it. And then we also can see um, in the more moderate to severe forms of OI, we can see some forearm deformities as well. Um, again, both the humerus and the forearm deformities tend to be more common in our moderate to severe patients. Um, and for a lot of patients, it's actually a functional problem, uh, especially in our wheelchair ambulators. The more deformity that you have in the arms, the harder it is um, and the less endurance you have if you're gonna be um, wheeling your own chair. Um, and for some patients, frankly, it's a cosmetic problem. Uh, we don't usually do surgery for cosmetic issues, um, but definitely for functional issues. And there have been some nice studies that have shown that it's helpful. The study came out, you can see several years ago, um, and a lot of patients have pain um, and uh, functional problems with their, um, their upper extremity deformity. And this study found that operative correction should be considered, especially when you have more and more deformity. We can see from these tables from this study um, that most of the time it was in the type three and four patients um, and the humerus, the radius and the ulna were all affected. And again, this, um, this table shows the maximum um, deformity angle and how their function was. And it, it, you can see the more um, moderate to severe types with the more deformity have lower numbers here for self-care and mobility, which just means you have more troubles um, doing acti activities of daily living and getting around in your chair. So we've had research that's shown that surgical cor correction um, can be helpful, um, but if you look in the past, um, upper extremity deformities um, were rarely, um, uh, deformities were rarely treated with surgery. Um, and we most commonly think of the lower extremities um, being treated. And you can see in the past, um, if you look at all of the literature um, in, our, in the orthopedic literature, only about 11. So the question is, why don't we just treat all upper extremity deformities? Um, and the, the reason being is because it's, it's surgically, it's technically um, can be more difficult than lower extremity deformities. Um, the bones in the upper extremities are much shorter and they're smaller in diameter. And so we have fewer options in, har in hardware as well. Um, and upper extremity deformities are less common um, in patients with OI than in lower extremity deformities. And then there was a historical belief um, that I think has in most um, up-to-date literature has been shown to not be true, but the historical belief was that upper extremity deformities could be well tolerated and cause little functional problems. And there are some patients who do tolerate their upper extremity deformities well, and if they're not having pain and it's not interfering with their function, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that just because they have a deformity, it needs to be treated. But there are other patients who don't tolerate the deformity well, and so these are case-by-case -case discussions with your surgeon. It's actually a patient I took care of with Dr. Cruz. Um, but this patient had a lot of functional problems. You can see a significant deformity. And so, um, but it's also not straightforward correction of the deformity because there's deformity in both the humerus and the forearm. And so this tackling this, um, this deformity um, takes some time and takes um, a lot of creativity from a surgical standpoint. But you can see there are lots of options. I think I showed this um, yesterday in a session, but this is a patient who obviously had some deformity down here by the elbow and also had this fracture. This was the treatment that was chosen because the bone was so small, we couldn't get a growing rod or a telescoping rod in at that point. And then you can see several years later, um, the bone is nice and straight and this rod is in there and the patient has had, hasn't had any more difficulties with the arm. So that surgery was very beneficial um, at that young age for this patient. We have different hardware options. Um, we can use um, K-wires um, or um, these 
type of rush rods. We can also use the FD rod or the, you know, the typical um, telescoping rod that we think of with OI. And then there's some other implants available that have some threads at the top that can anchor into the bone, but don't have any threads at the bottom. We tend to use these type of rods um, when either they, co they come smaller than the FD rods, so we'll use them um, if the bone is too small in diameter or if the patient is almost done growing and we don't need that rod to telescope with them. So just like any surgery, there can be complications. The, the problem is um, with migration of the hardware. The, the hardware can back out, it can grow down. Um, sometimes it's symptomatic, sometimes it's not. So just because you have a migration You can have bowing after the rod telescopes. So when it uncouples far enough, you get a weak area at the, between the two rods and you can get some bowing. And then obviously just because you have a rod in doesn't mean that you won't develop a fracture. And so fractures can still happen. Um, fractures when you have a rod in um, hurt much less than when you don't. Um, and um, sometimes if you have a, just because you have a fracture with a rod in doesn't mean you automatically need to have another surgery. If things are lined up appropriately, then the fracture can heal. But sometimes the, the rod will bend when you have a fracture as well. And then non-union where the bone doesn't heal um, is something that we as orthopedists, um, it's a challenging um, uh, thing that can happen. And so um, non-unions can be treated. We do tend to see non-unions in the humerus bone, um, and oftentimes it's more closer down by the elbow. There's some different techniques that we can try to try and get these to heal. One is using plates with a rod. We very rarely recommend using plates alone in OI bone um, because of the transition point and the stress that you can have at the end of the plate, but using it in combination with a rod can be very helpful. The forearm, most of the time when you have forearm deformities, it involves both the radius and the ulna bone in the forearm, but sometimes it will involve just one of the bones. Again, it's more common in our type three and type four patients. And you can have bowing or you can have a fracture or you can have both. With the forearms, the bones are much, much smaller than even the humerus and definitely smaller than the lower extremities. And so um, most of the time we're using rods that can't grow or telescope with the patient. So we're using wires, we're using something called flexible nails. Sometimes we can use um, the, the slim nail option that was shown earlier. But you can see the problem that occurs is you get the deformity corrected. And then as the patient grows, then you can have some bowing or a fracture at the end of those wires. And then they end up needing to have them revised if, if that becomes a problem. When just the ulna bone bows, um, which you can see here in this picture, the ulna is bowing the, and the radius doesn't bow, then oftentimes the radial head will go out of the joint and dislocate. This, this problem um, is something that we tend to see, again, more in our uh, moderate to severe patients. We don't have a good um, way of predicting which patients will have problems with that. And I think as we follow patients and pay more attention to the forearms over time, we'll get to know whether, um, whether we need to do surgery earlier to help prevent that from happening, if it will even prevent it from happening. There's so much that we need to learn about. Sometimes radial head dislocations won't be painful. Um, as you get older and are done growing, um, um, if that radial head is painful and is dislocated, then um, really the only treatment option is to resect the radial head. And I don't think there are very many of us that have a lot of experience with that. The form, um, the improvements in function um, have been shown in multiple studies. And in our patients that we have done forearm surgery on, they have, um, um, they're very happy that they've had it done if they were having problems with the forearm. The other thing that improves is, has been shown in studies is that the grip force um, for uh, grip also improves when you improve uh, the deformity. Just like the uh, humerus, um, the forearm has complications. Um, because we're putting in these smooth wires, um, they do tend to back out. Um, and if they do, we can sometimes just tap it back in. Um, 
and um, but migration of the hardware is a common problem. Again, growing off the ends of the wires and having fractures and then non-unions, just like in any bone, we can develop a non-union. And that is what I have for the upper extremity. Thanks, great job. to us about you say the upper part of lower extremity uh something we don't always talk about but worry about a lot for trulio uh in in particular um uh coxavera these are some of the problems that orthopedic surgeons worry a lot about and we're very happy to have rich with us today rich comes to us um from uh dupont uh and we'll I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Laura. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you very much for um, So my task was to talk about uh, issues that we don't commonly discuss, but we as surgeons are very, very aware of and, and conscious of. Uh, the two issues I'm going to discuss, one of them we do have somewhat of a surgical correction for. One of them is just kind of vexing us, and we're all, all of us are involved in research and thinking about this and ongoing discussions. I'd like to first thank uh, the OI Foundation and everybody during this time for allowing us to uh, present here and hope everybody's staying safe. And also to my partner, Gene Franzone, for uh, doing the lion's share of the work on these slides and this project. give a, a wonderful talk on the lower extremities, and we commonly see the lower extremities deformed, as he showed. But we as surgeons also look at the very upper part of the femur. Now, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is a normal-shaped femur on a child without OI. The, the ball of the femur is sitting basically in a socket, and that's your hip joint. So this is what the normal shape is. You have an angle from the neck of the femur, which is this right here, if you can see my mouse, I'm hoping you can, to the shaft of the bone. So that's normal. Now, if you look at the child with OI, many times in severe OI, with or without deformity of the femur, you can see either a separation or a, a misshapen top of the femur. This is called coxavara. And this is a bit of a problem in OI in identifying it and also treating it because it may be associated with femoral deformity it may not be associated with severe femoral deformity, but we as surgeons always look for it. So, and it's even a little confused because how your x-ray is taken gives you a false or a true impression as, is this deformity in the proximal femur real or just apparent? So this is the same patient with the femur taken in a different position, showing that this, this deformity on the left is a true coxavara, but when you, turn, when you turn it, it this seems to disappear or improve. So is it true? Probably not. It's positioning or rotation of the leg. So this is not so important to the patient, but to the surgeon in surgical planning and understanding the deformity in the entire femur, which all of us do. We pay attention to this. And Dr. Fossier def defined a, a special x-ray we take, uh, usually in the operation room, when we're addressing femoral deformity to decide if we have to address the hip with a separate and additional surgical procedure during the same sitting. So we can, and why does this matter? Well, that deformity in the femur can affect your walking because the angle of your hip is off. Obviously it can affect range of motion um, when limiting the hip. And it also puts your hip at risk for somewhat of a fracture too because of the change in the angle. Now there are, the original technique that most of us use in young children was again described by the Montreal group, particularly Dr. Fossier, and it is correctable in, in addition to the surgical while we're correcting the rest of the femur. But there are other ways we can do it, we can correct it now. There are pl the plates and screw options, but we have a lot of options. Uh, and I would emphasize that this, the specific technique is not as important as the fact that we understand this deformity and address it. The second of my task is to describe a more vexing problem called acetabular protrusio. 
Again, we're going to go to this 15. Look at the ball of the hip right here. It's sitting in the socket and looks very nice. Now, if you look at this 15 year old girl with severe osteogenesis imperfecta, you can see that the, the top of the femur seems to be going inside the pelvis. So when the femur seems to migrate inside the pelvis and the whole pelvis actually deforms, this is called acetabular protrusio. Now, obviously, if this is in going inside the pelvis, your femur is not supposed to be in your pelvis. Um, and this can create a problem. Now, this is a model of that severe deformity that you're seeing. This is a 3D uh, plastic model made from a CAT scan of somebody with severe acetabular protrusio. This is a normal uh, pelvis on the left. You can see the model here where the hip sits in a nice socket. And this is the complex deformity that occurs in protrusio. So it's not simply the hip. It's actually a progressive deformation of the entire pelvis. So it's, this is seen in other conditions, but in OI it's particularly complex because the whole pelvis is shaping and is taking a uh, changing shape. And this is a bit of a problem because we don't have an answer for it. Um, this was described by the Montreal group somewhat quite a while ago and in type three or the severe OIs, it seems to be much more prevalent. And the group in New York, Kathy Raggio and Dan Green studied this and they don't purport to have any answers, but they identified that it may, it may get just worse and worse over time due to the bone, the bone weakness and also, it may be influenced by increasing body mass index. So obesity and other things may lead to a progression um, of this acetabular protrusio. And obviously, this deformity makes our surgical corrections much different. The impact of medical treatment, such as bisphosphonates, seems to make sense that it would help slow down the progression of protrusio, as would nutritional and other measures. But to date, there are no studies that prove this. But we all, I'm sure all of us would agree that optimal nutrition, optimal BMI are nothing but good for the pelvis and the rest of the OI patient. If we let this progress, it affects the range of motion of the hip, it can cause hip pain, it can change, affect walking, and because the hip can get pinched, it can cause a femoral neck fracture. This is an example of a 16-year-old boy who had some left hip pain. You notice he has severe uh, protrusio from what we've described, and he has what's called a femoral neck fracture. Now, that's not a very good fracture to have because they're prone to non-union, excuse me, prone to pain. So this is something that, that uh, is very, that protrusio may preclu or, uh, pr 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 produce or contribute to. So we, now for some reason, there we go. So he required surgery in addition to the rotting for the protrusio. In addition, the the uh, arthroplasty surgeons work on the hip. Um, you, can, you can do it, but it's much more complicated to do. Uh, we've also now done some work and seeing the same concept as we get kids who have severe OI, the same concept seems to go to the shoulder. And this is a, a brand new and evolving concept. So here's a 17 year old. Now think of this like the hip. Here's the top of the humerus bone, the arm bone, sitting in the nice little socket of the, of the uh, shoulder blade. And here's a child with severe OI, and, and this protrusio is occurring in the shoulder. Now, we don't know what this means yet, but some of our patients complain that they have limited overhead motion. Uh, in fact, one of our adults with OI, an endocrinologist, actually has shoulder problems because of severe protrusio of the shoulder. So this is an evolving concept which we're looking at. And as to date, I don't think there's any of us that have a good surgical answer uh, for any of these problems. So to now, the focus is on doing what we can to optimize our bone health to minimize the risk. And that's what I have, thank you. Back to you, Laura. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm having trouble here in Laura. So, what? What's? Uh, well, if I yell, does that help? I think your connection was just going in and out a little bit. Ah, you can be better okay. now. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you, Rich. I, you know, 
uh, true confessions of the um, uh, surgeon and so, that so often we don't e pay attention to those, uh, particularly the protrusio because we're so busy fighting the fractures. Uh, but as our community ages, I think it's so important and I appreciate your insights, that's for sure. Now, on to yet another challenge uh, that faces us over time. Jean Franzone, who works with Dr. Cruz up at DuPont, uh, is, is going to talk to us about fracture uh, non-union. Always a worry. Thanks so much, Jean, for being with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. And a tremendous thank you to OIF for this virtual meeting, which has been a great way for folks really from all over the world to gather despite these uh, challenging times. To frame this discussion of revision surgery in the setting of OI, I'll recap our goals of orthopedic management to maximize each patient's function, to achieve developmental milestones for children as close fracture burden. A revision surgery is one that is performed after an initial, or as we'll sometimes refer to it, primary realignment and intramedullary rotting procedure has already taken place. In this two-year-old boy, he demonstrated progressive deformity and recurrent fractures of the lower extremities and has, and has been covered um, by my colleagues very well, underwent realignment and intramedullary rotting of the femurs with telescopic fossier duval intramedullary rods and the same procedure for the tibias as shown here. Now our goal is for children to grow. In an ideal world with growth, each end of the rod will remain appropriately fixed at the end of the bone as shown here and here. And with growth, the rod will telescope. This is an example of a two-year-old girl with a telescopic rod in the left femur at the age of two years old. It telescoped very nicely until the age of six years old. But we can see the junction of the two pieces of the rod has migrated up to the middle of the bone. She underwent a revision with a longer rod to better support the full length of the bone. Now it's not always an ideal world and these rods do not always remain fixed uh, just where we'd like them to stay in OI bone. It's a little bit unclear, do these rods sometimes migrate slowly over time or more likely does the bone tend to grow up and around the rod as can be seen here in the proximal femur or here about the knee. And these types of rod migrations may play a role in a discussion of revision surgery. So, so far we've covered two potential, but not always absolute indications for revision surgery, growth and rod migration. In the rest of the talk, I'll focus on a few other reasons, but certainly not an exhaustive list of why we might perform a revision surgery. A fracture with displacement or significant bending of a rod would be an indication for revision as shown here, as would an open fracture. That's a fracture where the bone actually protrudes through the skin, fortunately not too common in our OI population. As has been covered by a few other uh, speakers as well, a symptomatic non-union is also a reason for a revision surgery. This is a poorly healed fracture or osteotomy site. I cannot emphasize enough that each revision surgery must be considered on a patient and case specific level. And it's very important to have a discussion about the goals of the surgery, as well as the anticipated um, potential complications and the expectations for the surgery. Although intramedullary rods are truly a mainstay uh, in the management of both children and adults, of his tibia rod down by the ankle with this fracture. And we revised it to both a larger and longer telescopic intramedullary rod, given the fact that he does have anticipated remaining growth. Rods again may migrate in this instance within the setting of severe OI in such a way as to affect knee motion 
And the revision in this instance included one of the threaded non-telescopic rods already mentioned to try to avoid the same occurrence from happening again. In the setting of all different types of intramedullary rods, we may encounter non-union. What is non-union? As already mentioned, it is either a fracture or an osteotomy site that has not fully healed. And why do I ask here, is it symptomatic? The reason is there are many instances of an x-ray that may show signs of a non-union or an osteotomy site not fully healed, but they don't always cause trouble. This 10-year-old boy, as you can see, has intramedullary rods in all four bones of the lower extremities. And if we zoom in here on a lateral view of the tibia, we can see right where this arrow is, there are certainly signs that this osteotomy site anteriorly on the front of the bone has not fully filled in with bone. This does not cause him any symptoms and therefore an intervention at this point is not required. That could be contrasted to this 26 year old young man who has both pain and instability at this site of a non-union in the femur, as you can see, despite having undergone a number of procedures. Your surgeon may certainly um, begin a workup in the setting of a bothersome non-union. And this, this may include a workup of your nutrition level, certainly looking at vitamin D. Your surgeon may look for signs of an underlying infection that could be related to a non-union. And you may be asked about smoking or other exposures that can affect bone healing. This is an example of a 23-year-old young man with a bothersome non-union in the left humerus affecting function and causing pain as well as nerve issues. And he underwent a revision realignment intramedullary rotting with repair of the non-union and a procedure for the nerve as well. And this did significantly improve function and comfort. There's another issue we see in the setting of intramedullary rods and that is called stress shielding. What is that? It's, an, it's a phenomenon that happens which includes bone loss around an intramedullary rod and it makes revision surgery quite a bit more challenging. In this example, you can see the right femur here is a well-sized femur, yet looking at the left femur, there's very little bone to be seen around this intramedullary rod. And this row and the left femur over time, in the setting of this large intramedullary rod, you can see the bone has resorbed around the rod. The revision in this instance actually included downsizing uh, to a smaller intramedullary rod, realigning the bone and adding bone graft, and we did see improvement. This introduces what we like to refer to as the Goldilocks phenomenon of rod size. A rod that is too small may bend and break. One that is too large may introduce stress shielding. So the rod size really needs to be just right. And we often turn to the teaching of Professor Fossier, who has taught us, remember, the child needs more bone than metal. And this brings up a point you may have noticed in quite a few of uh, these revisions and also introduced by Dr. Wallace, uh, the concept of a supplemental plate and screw construct to add stability, not alone, but in the setting of an intramedullary rod. And Dr. Esposito and his team have reported on this in the, in the distal humerus, which is down by the elbow, which as we've covered is a site that can be a little bit prone to non-unions developing. Our partners in Korea have also reported on supplemental plate and screws, and we've looked back at our results as well. This is an example of a 10-year-old boy with type 3 OI who underwent realignment and intramedullary rotting of the left humerus back in 2011, and the rod served him very well for about six years until it bent at the site of a fracture right down here, fairly close to the elbow when he slipped and fell at school. The revision included not only a new intramedullary telescopic rod, but also a small plate with supplemental screws to add additional stability at this site that can be prone to non-union. He went on to heal well. Another option to provide additional fixation in the setting of a revision surgery is allograft bone or bone from the bone bank. And this can be used in a number of different ways and has been described by a few teams in the setting of OI. 
And what this brings us to is revision surgery is certainly a part of the management in a comprehensive program of OI. It, it does play a role and it's important to have a very large toolbox. We, we need to be ready to address intraoperative challenges as they arise. We often mention we certainly go to the operating room with plan A, B, C, but we always need to be ready to go all the way to plan Z to address certain challenges as they come up. Having additional forms of fixation, as mentioned, can be helpful. The same principles of early mobilization, perhaps using aqua therapy to initiate weight bearing, are still very important, as is a dedicated full perioperative team. And on that note, and I'd like to thank all of you for your time and attention and look forward to our question and answer session. Fantastic job. Thank you very, very much. Jane, that was absolutely great. Um, can I get you to unshare? Wonderful. All righty. And I do believe I'm next up and we're going to see if I have redeemed myself or not. That's always the challenge with these Zoom calls. Uh, and I just have a quickie presentation, uh, but one that uh, for me uh, has been great news. Um, yes. Okay. So I'm going to speak. Pardon? Looks great. It's a miracle. Um, one of the great things uh, I think that has happened in OI surgery uh, is something, and, and frankly, all orthopedic surgery is something called guided growth. Alignment is everything. Soft bone is like a, a little like the Tower of Pisa, it likes to tip over a bit or become deformed uh, if, if the child or adult too is not well aligned. Now, language is always tough. And I went to my favorite medical journal, uh, Google, uh, to get these wonderful pictures and I had actually never um, uh, learned this way about thinking about genuvalgum and verum uh, before. Uh, but uh, genuvalgum is basically good old fashioned knock knees and is what I see the most in my OI uh, children often after I've uh, rotted their femurs and we've corrected enough bowing here and there that the knees aren't quite straight up and down afterward. Genuverum can occur. I love that bottle of rum, uh, but it, for my practice, is certainly far less common. Now, I always tease and say that everything in orthopedics is named after dead white guys. No offense to the men on this call. Um, but but uh, in fact, our ability to, to correct varus and valgus and, and our appreciation of the biomechanical realities of varus and valgus are attributed to Dr. Carl Huter and Dr. Richard von Volkman, who, as you can see, lived over 100 years ago. Whoops. Yes. So what they showed us is that the growth plate is a really sensitive goes down. If it feels it's under tension, it speeds up. Oh, whoops. So how does that have translate when we're talking about the OI child? Well, if you look carefully at that picture of genuvalgum, you'll see that the outside aspects of the distal femur proximal tibia are feeling a tremendous amount of compression so they're going to slow down in their growing, whereas the out insides are feeling tension and they're going to grow faster. What this really leads to is the fact that one, nature isn't going to fix this for us, and in fact, that the deformity is likely to get worse and make walking more difficult and falling more probable. So when I first started out in the million years ago, um, uh, we only had little staples and they were awful. They would pop out, back out, 
uh, et cetera. And it was the uh, invention of what we call the eight plate that really changed our ability to help the kiddos. And what you're seeing is that a little plate looking like a figure of eight is placed here on the inside aspects of the distal femur and a screw is placed above the growth plate and below the growth plate, thus creating for the growth plate the sense that it's under compression. So it slows down. And when all goes well, you can see the picture now to your right, we don't get a lot of new bone on the inside, but we get extra new bone on the outside and the deformity corrected without ever making a big incision, without ever cutting the bone. Uh, and so the recovery is unbelievably better. And just um, a, a simple example, here's a, a young, young man, uh, his valgus wasn't awful, but you can see it progressing over time. And um, the simple placement of these little eight plates uh, led to a very nice correction that he has maintained into adulthood. I think I was lucky there. We typically take the plates out at about two years. And they're very small. And I love this other Google image for you. Uh, as you can see, they're uh, even smaller uh, than a paper clip. I will admit, though, that OI skin is often quite thin, and those screw heads can be a problem. But luckily, usually, they are not. Now, just to show you the incredible eye, uh, but, but it's a wonderful, shall I say, story. So here is a child with another soft bone problem, um, uh, not taking his medicines and getting worse over time, we were able to pretty rapidly correct him um, and made it so much easier for him to walk. Uh, and he went along for a while, didn't take his medicines, uh, and the deformity started coming back. And what you see on the left, on the patient's left or your right as you face uh, that image, at, because a child was approaching the end of growth, I was able to use a screw, which is far less prominent uh, under the skin and often far more comfortable. And, and we ultimately had to go back on the other side, but full growth, he's nice and straight um, with minimal surgery, no breaking the bone ever. Uh, a great triumph uh, when we're dealing with any of our rare bone conditions. So just a little language for you, a little celebration of guided growth. Uh, and now we're gonna go on to my colleague, Dr. Peter Smith, uh, who is gonna give a fantastic talk uh, on lower extremity rotting. Peter comes to us from the shrine in Chicago uh, and, and has been working hard on OI since the day I met him. There we go. Well, thank you. Uh, I really have enjoyed the, the talk so much. Uh, and um, this is one of my favorite meetings. As Laura said, I've been going for 28, 29 years now and uh, seen, seen how things have grown. Um, and so it's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, uh, invited to be part of this group. Um, you know, I'm going to just reinforce some points uh, that have been made by the excellent speakers before before me. Um, we know that bone that uh, OI is a collagen disorder, and um, you know, collagen provides really basically the tension uh, in bone. The cement part of it is formed by the hydroxyapatite or the calcium. Um, so, so the, these failures happen uh, because there's not enough um, tensile force in the bones and, and the bowing and uh, leads into that. So the, the bone uh, qualities uh, are what the surgeons are interested in. We 
talk about today. And um, you can see that, that the biology of the bone is very important too. So your bones are, are growing and they're responding to the forces that they see, just like um, Laura and everyone else talked about. And um, what can happen if, if in OI, more than other conditions, is that the treatment of regular fractures over time with casts, which usually work, work quite well in, in, in children and, and do work in, in some children with OI, uh, really uh, go awry as you begin to have more deformity and um, less uh, use of the extremity. They, they undergo this tremendous uh, atrophy. So here's a child that, that was straight, that was in spica cast for long periods of time. And, and these are the things that uh, was recognized that there's this uh, immobilization leads to osteoporosis, leads to more fractures. Um, and how do you break up that vicious cycle? Well, you can do it with appropriate physical therapy and casting in some cases. Other cases, you need to do um, uh, uh, rotting, which uh, Dr. Esposito uh, talked about the important uh, decision-making role in, um, in when to do rotting and, um, and how that helps the rehabilitation of children and, and adults uh, as well to allow them to get back to, to normal function. So I can't, I can't have, be at this conference without uh, recognizing Dr. Sofield and Miller. I saw, I saw in the chat that someone said they, they had been treated by Dr. Sofield. So uh, kudos to you. Um, Dr. Miller just passed on this last year at the age of 99 years old. And many of you may have been uh, his patients uh, as well. And, and they're the ones really that recognized that, uh, that the bone needed to be supported and darned if they didn't try plates and screws back in the 1930s. Um, and then they, of course, uh, published a, a very uh, influential paper about putting rods in. But we know that the technique is, is completely different now, as Dr. Esposito and other people have showed. Now we can do many of these procedures just with um, very small uh, incisions and using the, the x-ray uh, procedure. But the principle was revolutionary and has revolutionized the, the functional ability of people with uh, OI. And um, of course now uh, in, in Montreal, Dr. Fazier uh, with uh, the engineer uh, Duval uh, developed this rod uh, that it expands. Uh, there are other expanding rods available uh, internationally, um, but this is the most commonly used one. And you can see now with uh, you can have a, from Dr. Fazier's talk that I use and that have been used well. Now, can you use other kinds of rods? Well, sure you can. Uh, the titanium rods are very available in all the trauma centers and are widely used in pediatrics. Um, we don't tend to like them because they don't expand and they don't uh, have quite the material properties that we would might, might want to see. Uh, on the other side is called a Bailey de Beau, which was the original expanding rod. Uh, now, uh, this just shows again why, why you might uh, think, um, some people might think plates would work, but I just wanted to reinforce that um, here's a child at a, at a very good hospital in China, had this uh, surgery uh, performed to fix this uh, area of a fracture, and darned if the fracture didn't heal, but then right below there is an area where there's stress going to happen and a fracture. So. So the whole bone generally needs to be protected, especially if it's such a small, um, fragile bone. And um, Jean uh, Franzone talked very well about the different, and, and other people have talked about the complications that you might expect from rotting. Again, these junctional problems seem to be the, the, the biggest issue to try to avoid uh, junctional areas between the stiff and fragile uh, bone. And this is how I answer this in China at a, at a conference. I said, this is how you say, I'm sorry, I don't know in Chinese. We don't really know what the ideal rod stiffness is, but we know that it's uh, probably along the lines of, of the quote from Dr. Fazier that you don't want to make it too, too stiff where you get uh, all kinds of uh, stress shield. Now the, the OI Foundation uh, gave money uh, to form this uh, Link Clinical Research Center 
And now, 10 years later, we're, we're starting to look at the uh, results and, and publish them. So I, I thought it would be good to show uh, what the kinds of things we're looking at uh, with uh, rods. Um, so of the group of, uh, I think this is about 800 uh, people who are participating, uh, most of them type one, but of all the different types. And within that population, um, you can see that if you have a type one OI, you're not likely to have uh, rotting, at least in this, in this group of, uh, but if you have a type four or type three, there's about 70% of the individuals will have uh, some kind of a rotting uh, procedure. And um, so the indications for your type of OI, um, and there are many, many different uh, vari variations on this among the types, but generally uh, for type one, you can expect like this girl that, that you might have one or two rotting procedures uh, for femur fractures. You can very nicely. This we talked about, and then the, the indication that Dr. Um, Esposito and others have talked about the, the severe OI where they're pulling to stand and have uh, a better chance of a uh, of better function with uh, of supporting the bones with the rods. Um, again, uh, bilateral rotting is, is more common in the more severe types uh, up to 70 or 80% of, of individuals with type three. And most of the type three patients at our centers, and this is by no means uh, something that has to be done, but at the centers that, that were, were participating, it seemed to be that uh, most of the patients with uh, type three were undergoing the rotting before they, or as they started pulling to stand or before they started walking. Whereas it, with the type four, most of the patients had been walking and then uh, we're succumbing to different fractures as they, as they started out or later along uh, as they became more active. Expanding rods we've talked about depends upon the size of the bone and, and the timing for that um, is important. Um, most uh, at our centers, uh, these five or uh, six centers, uh, most of the femurs have expanding rods. Uh, most of the tibias have uh, non-expanding. But again, this includes adults who had this surgery a long time ago and, and things are changing so that um, as we go along, uh, we're changing our practice so that more patients are having surgery earlier and um, more of the expanding rods are being used. Type four is a mixed bag. You know, actually, uh, if you have a type four OI, the, it's the within that group, the, the highest functioning individuals did not have rods. So you don't, doesn't mean you have to have rods. If you have a type four, uh, you, you can get by pretty well. It's just that if you run into trouble with the fractures and the bowing, uh, then, then uh, as happens in about 70% of individuals with those kind of OI, uh, based on our uh, information, uh, you will uh, benefit from some kind of rotting. And you can see that the improvement in function uh, is, is pretty dramatic for the type three patients. Uh, if you have a severe OI, you're much more likely to do things like um, take steps backwards, kick a ball, uh, step over an object, uh, walk carrying an object if you've had a rotting. Now this is not, by no means possible for all the individuals with OI of these types but you could see about 50% of them that had the rotting were able to do it, whereas uh, almost none that did not have uh, rotting were able to do these more complicated tasks. The age of the rotting in the last uh, 15 years has gone down and I, I expect that trend will continue uh, as uh, anesthetic techniques and other things become uh, uh, better. Also, I think the bisphosphonates have played a big role in earlier um, function, uh, functional abilities of our more severe patients. So I, I thank you for your time and uh, I look forward to participating in the discussion. Peter, great overview and, and I am right there with you. The 
ability to give the kiddos bisphosphonates have really changed our expectations. Partnered with RODS, um, so many of my type three kiddos, it, it's taken for granted that they'll walk, which doesn't, just wasn't our dream uh, when I first started out. It's been so very, very exciting. Paul, do you want to go ahead and bring up your spine slides uh, real quick, just to give us a quick overview um, uh, uh, about some updates on spine surgery? And if anyone isn't following the chat box, um, uh, as was alluded to earlier, uh, uh, Ann Swanson's tribute to Dr. Sofield uh, it's just wonderful and, and not to be missed. And I don't think the chat box survives when we put this on YouTube. So don't miss it, please. All righty, Paul, over to you. I'm unmuted now. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Millar. I had the pleasure of meeting he with Dr. Smith, who Dr. Smith didn't tell you, but he was kind of a mentor to him for many years. Dr. Millar and I both, were both naval officers at the Naval Hospital Oakland. It just happened to be about 35 years apart. But anyway, the, the things that are up and coming, and I'm not a spine surgeon anymore. I kind of gave that up when I became more of an OI surgeon. But the biggest issues are scoliosis and kyphosis, and the issues there are how's your lung function and can you sit, craniocervical junction pathology. Dr. Shaw gave a great talk yesterday as part of this meeting. I'm not going to get into that a lot, other than to say we're very cognizant of that. And I think it's especially true when anesthetics are undertaken because uh, we very carefully hold the head, make sure the child doesn't get hyperextended and cause an injury because we just don't know who has it. And Dr. Shaw also said yesterday, and I agree, we need to look more closely at it uh, and make sure we know who has it and are they symptomatic and do they need treatment. And then spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis is one of the biggest causes of pain in the lower back. And when we looked at all the kids we x-rayed on a yearly basis, Probably about 35 to 40 percent. Doesn't mean it's totally painful, but we just look there. So what what treatment has happened? What what's changed? Well, compression fractures are obviously big things, and people with type three and type four OI, I think, astound us all because when we see adults or uh, teenagers who have a compression fracture of the spine, they usually are having pain for four to six weeks and having a lot of trouble. Uh, my experience with most of the kids is they'll tell you that. Even with the squash at 50%, if you look on that left picture, you can see the amount of wedging. It's usually two or three days and they're kind of back at doing things again. And then we get an x-ray six months later and the parents are astounded by how much deformity is there. But the nice thing is with pomidronate and zolidronate that those vertebral bodies get better over time as happened in this case. So what about scoliosis? Everybody wants to know, can you treat it? The kids with more severe disease, bracing doesn't work. It actually creates rib deformities, causes lung problems. Uh, and we do still use criteria for, for operating. And a lot of people are doing more surgery now, especially Dr. Shaw and others. Uh, when it gets to be 45 or 50 degrees and the child's reasonably mature, then it's time to do surgery. Uh, and with the newer techniques with screws at every level, it's, it's, it's more reasonable to do now. And clearly with anesthetic techniques improving, that's a vital, a vital change. Now that doesn't mean everybody gets fused. There are cases of kids that don't, can't be fused because their bones too severely involved. So there are things too that we use with uh, transisemic acid is something you hear about. That's something that cuts down on bleeding. We're exploring that. Dr. Wallace is looking at even in lower extremity surgery, does that prevent some of the need for transfusion. So we know that a lot of kids have this basilar invagination, basilar impression. So if people are symptomatic, meaning headaches, weakness, uh, trouble with their tongue fasciculating, a lot of little subtle things, then we start looking and that's an indication for an MRI scan. But when we look at the people and it's uh, specifically different types have a higher level of involvement. And again, the spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, in my experience, very few of any people actually need operations for that, but it can be something that causes low back pain and needs to be followed. And these are the stress fractures. It used to be we said that there was a dysplastic type where this pars, so the arrows pointing would just be longer. We now think that that's what recurrent stress fractures and heals. The vertebrae slides forward a little bit, and then it just looks like it's longer but healed. Uh, 
And people always ask too about the growing rods. There's more people working with uh, the magnetic growing rods. Some of them have been used in people with OI. I think that's still experimental and has to be very, very specifically looked at. Um, and, uh, but I think that's something that's changing rapidly. And this is our team and like everyone else that's on this talk, I don't think any of us feel like we could do anything that we do for our families and our patients without everyone involved in that team. So thank you to the OI Foundation. Thank you to my person again. Thank you, Paul, for that wonderful overview. Uh, it's just great. Um, and uh, righty. Melissa, how shall we do this? Um, well, I'll go ahead and I can go ahead and ask the questions we've been receiving. We have been I, I don't mind. I'm going to do that. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Right? But you be the picture. That's a nice thing. Well, you be the picture. <laughs> all right. So, so um, uh, thank you all for the chat box. Again, I urge you to read Ann Swanson's uh, comments because they have been so uh, terrific. Um, um, although we don't typically want to um, comment on individual cases, um, there is a comment or request on the chat box that, that I do think is fair to address, um, and that's a tibial non-union. And, and I am going to do my usual feminist um, uh, statement, which is, my golly gee whiz. Uh, you know, even with the worst life expectancy data in OI, uh, an individual who is 25 is expected to live 40 to 60 more years. How can you leave a non-union place? How can you live with that pain? The, the challenge, I would argue, is the technology to fix it. Um, um, and we don't have the x-rays and, and whatnot. But my view is no way is a bone stimulator going to fix it. You have to fix the alignment, get the old rod out, get uh, some sort of new rod back down, get it straight, and then get it to heal. But I turn it over, Gene, you in particular have your interest uh, in, in non-unions. Thoughts from you, please. Yeah, it's a really important topic and, you know, especially in the tibia, um, not that we don't see non-unions other places, but the tibia is covered by muscle and robust tissue uh, in the back of the leg, but is right underneath the skin in the front of the leg. We think that is one of the reasons that we tend to see non-unions a little more commonly in the tibia. And um, I fully agree with you, Dr. Tosi, you know, the, the first step is, is it bothersome or is it not? And if it is, really proceeding with a workup, you know, first making sure that your bone is as healthy as it can be, that you're as healthy as you can be, and that includes nutrition, that there's no infection there, that um, vitamin D levels are good, and then once, once all that is in place, you know, proceeding, again, if it's bothersome, with an intervention to improve the healing, um, agreeing with um, and doing it in such a way, you know, we apply our general orthopedic principles to these complex issues, but always recognizing that, you know, OI bone is, is different and, you know, the types of implants we, you know, may be able to use um, in folks without OI, you know, may not fit in, in certain OI bones, um, paying attention to protect, um, you know, the full length of the bone as has, you know, been discussed already, um, and then perhaps other adjunctive ways uh, to, to get it to heal. Um, and that may involve future you know, procedures down the road to even take some hardware out after, after healing has been achieved. But also really paying attention to while addressing this non-union that the rest of the patient also stays active and weight-bearing and really as, as strong and healthy as possible. Here, here. Uh, and I, I confess a, a little bit of a political comment. I am worried a plate, I think, couldn't hold on to this adequately to allow it to heal. Uh, I think one of the miracles of OI treatment is that we use the rods to uh, make sure that the bone is straight, that the alignment is right. Is that your experience, Jean? 
Yeah, absolutely. Protecting the full length of the bone and, and really emphasizing, like you said, good, good alignment and, you know, early weight bearing when possible. I, this case also brings up um, something that really isn't a topic for this uh, uh, panel, but is, I would argue, a incredible political problem for OI and right your cons congressman. This is an individual who's 25. And so many of us are limited at our hospitals either to stop seeing folks at 18 or at my hospital at, at 22. Um, uh, but it is my great hope um, that adults with OI can find help often from a appropriately trained trauma doc. Um, and, and many of our orthopedic colleagues who've done trauma fellowships are ironically because of the expansion of elderly folk um, more astute about managing frail bone uh, than they used to be. And, and with luck, um, uh, there would be hope that a partnership could be even made uh, between a trauma doc uh, and this young patient. Uh, because I think everything we know is that exercise is what keeps people he healthy. And if we can't people help people, no, no, if we can't keeping them healthy, so that's my political comment for the moment. Um, there was another comment I just wanted to speak to. Um, um, and certainly I had alluded to it earlier and, and uh, how shall I say some of us older ones. Um, uh, the question was, does rotting also provide the opportunity for a severe type to walk or can it be considered for cosmetic or other reasons if walking doesn't seem to be in the cards? Certainly, my expectation at this point is whereas I didn't expect any of my severe kids to walk when I started out, I was just trying to make them comfortable. Now, I expect and kind of demand that, that all of my severe kiddos at least exercise ambulate um, because I'm a big believer in exercise uh, as a health issue. And the other comment I would make, and again, I look to my colleagues to jump in, is how difficult it is to listen to adults talk when they talk about their 200, 250 prior fractures. And, and I think the combination of odding and bisphosphonates means that my kids, even though my severe kids have one or fewer fractures a year, and I'm just curious if, if that's the experience of the other folks on this panel. I can, I can say something about that, Laura. Uh, you know, um, I was always taught, yeah, that, that, mo that uh, rotting didn't make uh, people walk or not. It, it was really this, the type of OI that they had. Uh, I think our children are, and I, I think there is some reality to that. Um, uh, the genetics have a lot to do with it. Um, when we look at our, our groups of, uh, when we look at mobility within our Link Clinical Research Center, uh, we found that, for example, most uh, individuals with type 3 OI were not community ambulators. Now, I, I do agree that the children, the infants we're treating are, are pulling to stand and they're doing more, more things. I, I don't know if uh, Francis has a, a sort of a overview of this. Um, I think we can expect our children to be, uh, to, to make those attempts and to, to do standing and, and to be much more independent at an earlier age. As adults, um, we're not gonna throw away the wheelchairs uh, for that severe group. Um, but the rotting, I think, uh, has helped them to do uh, a lot of, um, of these uh, independence tasks. And do you agree with few? But but they you know they're still happening, and even with the rods in place, they still have some fractures. I think we can't promise that that the bisphosphonates and the rotting are the, the final solution. You know we 
we have to work towards the genetic uh, uh, issues too. But um, I think I think it the the future is is brighter for these kids to avoid being in the hospital for so long, for being in cast for so long, and for being much more active and, and participating. Thank and you. I think our, our goal is to make people more functional, but realistic. I mean, there's a difference. If you're up and active, you develop more of a personality and a, and a goal in life, if you can do that early, anticipating that as you get more mass, it gets harder. So just because you walk as a child with type three or type four doesn't mean that's going to be the most important thing to you when you're an adult. Most important thing is to be able to stand up, transfer, and be able to get around your house one way or another. Yeah, Laura, if I may comment just a little bit, I, you, you've heard for the audience, you've heard that to me, the, it's an evolution in the relationship. It's, it's a partnership in maximizing function. Um, I've gotten away from counting fractures. I've gotten away from from doing such, but early on with our physicians and with our patients, we and the, the entire multidisciplinary team, we have to uh, motivate the patient and the team to just monitor achievable and desirable goals for the patient. It's not about counting fractures, it's about maximizing function. And uh, I recently had an adult who came in from an outside physician who, who said uh, she was ambulatory, she was a little slow getting around, but was fully functional. And she said her doctor was, quote, putting her in a wheelchair because she was slow and he was afraid of fracture. Um, it was too late. It, it was just sad to see. Um, there was no partnership. There was no shared decision making. There was no evaluation of what the patient really wanted out of their entire life. So to me, I, I've really shifted to that relationship and establishing those parameters that what do you need as an individual to maximize your life? And, and let's achieve that, or let's go for it. Very well said, extremely well said. Um, I wanted to hit a couple of questions that we may not be helpful on. Um, um, the one question was, do we recommend femoral or humeral surgery for adults? Um, and that's a toughie. Um, um, and, and there are actually two issues. There's really the rotting surgery, where I would be very personally hesitant to be doing osteotomies and looking for healing. Um, uh, and there's joint replacement, where at least in mild OI, there has been a question came up about an ankle replacement here, and I would have a tougher uh, uh, time knowing what how to answer that just wanted to throw out sort of we are all unfortunately and realistically all pediatric orthopods um, and so our adult experience is quite limited um, but I, I wondered if anyone in the panel could speak on any of those issues well I might make a few comments I've, I've spent some recent time searching kind of the world for joint replacements that have been done in OI uh, and found very few uh, individual cases is all you can find. Um, in the world without osteogenesis imperfecta that has ankle replacements, there's still a, a work in progress. Um, they still are prone to high complication rates um, and should, in my advice, only be done in expert surgeons who are facile and have lots of experience in ankle replacements. So in OI, there's, there's maybe a case or two around, but no data you can hang your hat on. So I'm a little reticent to, to recommend that, and I'll defer to my colleagues if they've heard anything else. Go ahead. Can Hello, you Dr. Gloria. How nice to see you. Thank you for being with us. Does Francis want to be unmuted? He is now unmuted. No. Oh, no. Okay. No, I can't talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, let me out because I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I can say that I, I get calls from adults that are in hospitals uh, with fractures, uh, and I try to link them up to adult um, surgeons. I, I think it's an un, un, unsolved problem. For example, when... Um, when an adult with a severe type of OI has a hip fracture, there, there's, there's a lot of people that are unwilling to operate on them. 
or that that want to uh, tackle that. And yet, uh, to me, I think that a lot of times they end up giving up you know, a lot of, uh, fu of their function uh, when that happens, when they're uh, when they don't have surgery. So I, I, I think it's a complicated decision, but we definitely need more um, to engage more adult surgeons in, in these kind of things. I think there have been patients with, uh, I mean, individuals with uh, OI that have done well with uh, joint replacements. And there are, are adults that have uh, been able to heal um, non-unions and things like that. Uh, with surgery, it's, it's it's it becomes more difficult, but um, I think I think it 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 involves a, a discussion with uh, adult surgeons, and and many of us would like to do more. So we can follow our own patients and. We're getting more and more experience on operating on the upper and lower extremities, and uh, it's it's doable. It should be done. Again, it's an individual evaluation. Um, the healing rates seem to be a little bit more uh, difficult, uh, and some of the problems are a little more difficult. But it certainly is not something that should just because you're an adult say no, you can't do it. It's an individual decision, undertaking the risks and discussion with your surgeon. And I we've we have. Uh, we're developing a fair experience in upper extremity surgery in adults now, and uh, you know it's plus minus. I have to don't have to, I have to look at our data. It's doable, but the risks are there, and they're probably a little bit higher than children because of the healing rate. But again, to go back to your comment, Laura, um, the bone health has to be optimized. The patient's health has to be optimized. Thank you for that. I I do think that's so critical. And um, there's no question that vitamin D and calcium are not going to, in and of themselves, prevent uh, osteoporosis or non-unions, but they will contribute uh, to the healing and it's important to watch out for. I don't know how many were um, uh, in the adult section yesterday, but I think for adult women, um, one of the critical unanswered questions is what to do during the menopause. And if you weren't part of that session, I urge you, urge you, urge you to listen to Deb Krakow's presentation, which was quite insightful, uh, to say, to say the least. And um, Dr. Spazzi, I have room for interrupt. Um, yep. that brings up the women's adult health session will be beginning at three o'clock today. Um, and so we do have a hard stop on this session in about two minutes. So probably one more right. question. Um, uh, the, an interesting question that came up early on the chat line, um, not, again, not what we do particularly, but do we feel is an increased risk of avascular necrosis in the, of the femoral neck um, when one of our uh, either kids or adults with OI has a femoral neck fracture um, and, and here I, I really s switch to you, uh, Dr. Cruz, because it always seems like the kids with the femoral neck fractures are the ones with Petruzio, and it's so hard to see. Do you have any insights? Well, I know we're really short on time, so I'm going to say that the incidence of, fem of osteonecrosis in the femoral head in OI from the surgeries is probably non, is very low, fortunately. And, I know, Paul, we just recently talked about this, about some cases. High velocity trauma that we're seeing in other patients. So there, that may be a little bit protective. However said, the healing rate in femoral neck fractures is lower than others. So, but avascular necrosis seems to be less of a risk. It, it, right. happens, it happens rarely, but not, not that often. I think I have one, one child that had AVN out of, 10 or so so it, it but it, it usually is very amenable to just putting the screws there like like rich showed all right well this was a wonderful panel and i am beyond grateful to you all for your different insights i hope that our participants uh have some imp increased uh, uh appreciation for the ex 
extraordinarily wonderful improvements that have occurred um, over the last 50 years or so. Uh, thanks, starting with Dr. Sofield and Millard. Um, it's been so exciting to be part of this, as is how I would summarize it. My great thanks to the panel, and I hope you'll all join us in the closing ceremony today. Um, uh, there are some wonderful presentations I will be talking to. I'm not wonderful, but you'll love it. So please join us. And of course, we have more sessions coming now, uh, including women's health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tosi, and thank you to all of our speakers today. I'd also like to thank our sponsors for the virtual conference, um, and especially Pega Medical, who is the sponsor for today's surgical session. Thank you all so much, and I hope we'll see you at our additional sessions the rest of this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.